नमस्कार फ्रेंड्स सो वेलकम टू सेशन 22 टू ऑफ अवर कोर्स ऑन मैनुफैक्चरिंग गाइडलाइंस फॉर प्रोडक्ट डिज़ाइन सो वी हैव स्टार्टेड नाउ डिस्कसिंग द इंडिविजुअल गाइडलाइंस और द स्पेसिफिक गाइडलाइंस फॉर स्पेसिफिक प्रोसेसिस एंड इफ यू गो बैक टू द प्रीवियस सेशन और मे बी प्रीवियस टू थ्री सेशन मे बी सेशन नंबर नाइनटीथ ट्वेंटीथ ट्वेंटी फर्स्ट आवर फोकस हैज़ बीन ऑन स्पेसिफिक प्रोसेसिस वी हैव ऑलरेडी डिस्कस्ड द स्पेसिफिक डिज़ाइन गाइडलाइंस फॉर सैंड कास्टिंग प्रोसेस स्पेसिफिक डिज़ाइन गाइडलाइंस फॉर डाई कास्टिंग प्रोसेस स्पेसिफिक डिज़ाइन गाइडलाइंस फॉर कंप्रेशन मोल्डिंग विच इज़ अ वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट एज वेल एज कमर्शियल प्रोसेस फॉर मैनुफैक्चरिंग ऑफ प्लास्टिक पार्ट्स वेर एज सैंड कास्टिंग एंड डाई कास्टिंग आर इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर गिविंग शेप और फॉर फॉर्मिंग द मेटेलिक पार्ट्स सो वी हैव सीन दैट हाउ द प्रोडक्ट डिज़ाइन कैन इन्फ्लुएंस द प्रोसेस और हाउ द डिज़ाइन कैन हेल्प अस टू मेक द प्रोडक्ट्स ऑफ गुड क्वालिटी मैनी टाइम्स द डिज़ाइनर्स आर नॉट अवेयर ऑफ द इज गाइडलाइंस एंड देयर फॉर दे डिज़ाइन द पार्ट्स एज इट लुक्स गुड टू दैम बोथ द फंक्शनल एज वेल एज द एस्थेटिक considerations of product design are taken care by the designers but sometimes in many cases the designers are not able to appreciate or not able to highlight or not able to emphasize the manufacturing design guidelines so sometimes they do not consider and they just feel that the product is looking good it is satisfying the function for which the product has been designed and therefore they pass on that design to the manufacturing stage but these days the time is a very very important factor so we do not want to waste any time and therefore the product designers must make use of these guidelines while finalizing the design of their product so that when the product goes into the manufacturing stage it is manufactured to the best possible quality in the most efficient and effective manner and therefore this course is important now coming on to the specific processes that we are discussing all of you are well aware that we have already seen as i have just now told guidelines for sand casting guidelines for die casting guidelines for compression molding and in the last session we started we thought that we will be able to cover the design guidelines for both compression molding and the second one was the extrusion but extrusion we were not able to cover in detail so today we will start our discussion with extrusion and then finally jump over to injection molding and most of the times you will see that the guidelines are majorly related to some specific design attributes again i will reiterate those design attributes we are talking about the wall thickness what can be the wall thickness that can be achieved by a specific process we are talking of ribs and bosses which are sometimes used to strengthen our part give stiffness to our part we are talking about the wall thickness as i have already told the ribs we are talking about the tolerance that we can achieve we are talking about the surface finish that we can achieve uh, we are talking about the recesses that we can create within a product so more or less the at geometrical attributes are same but specific processes have specific characteristics or the special advantages that for example if we see injection molding it has a specific application that it can be used for thin walled complex shaped plastic products so it has a special characteristics whereas in case of other processes which are there for Uh, polymer processing it may sometimes become difficult to process the very thin plastic parts so therefore the overall attributes or the design attributes more or less are same but the processes differ based on their special characteristics so today our target is to first learn about the extrusion all of you know in the previous session session number 21 we have focused on extrusion that what is extrusion process how the product is made and that is not basically our target our target is to understand the design guidelines for the extruded parts and we will focus on those design guidelines today so in case of extrusion we have seen that it is used for making continuous long 
parts with uniform cross sections the parts can be hollow or they can be solid now depending upon the profile of the part the process will become more and more complex if it is a simple cylindrical or a tubular long part it is easy to be made it is it can be easily made or it is easy to be manufactured by the process of extrusion so that is basically our target that let us see now how the part must be designed so that it is easy to extrude so let us quickly now start our discussion on extruded parts so a large variety why variety because depending upon the uh, cross section of the part we can have a large variety of parts a large variety of parts are made by the extrusion process although most design recommendations are similar to those for the molded parts so this is what i have already highlighted sometimes we say sharp corners must be avoided they must be rounded off sometimes we give the recommendations regarding the ribs corners so most of the recommendations design recommendations focused on are focused on the same geometrical features but still the processes have different capabilities so although most design recommendations are similar to those for molded parts the following are some specific only for extruded parts so what we are going to cover now are the specific design requirements for the product which are to be made by the extrusion process so specific design considerations for extruded plastic parts are what we are going to see in the subsequent slides now we can see regarding the wall thickness very very important guideline the extruded part should have a uniform wall thickness which is common to most of the processes which are used for making the plastic parts now here we can see here the cross section is not uniform here the cross section is different above this line and here the cross section is different so when the cross sections are different we can see a bow can be induced by the uneven cooling so it will not air uh, lead to uniform cooling basically we wish that uniform cooling must take place but in many cases this uniform cooling may not take place why because of the difference in the cross section and therefore this type of a bow is created and this is one of the defects that may take place and therefore we must ensure that uniform wall thickness is there in our plastic part that we have designed if a part is designed with uneven wall thickness the center of gravity is skewed to one side or the other causing problems with part straightness because the part will cool faster on one side than the other so already this has been highlighted that uneven cooling must be avoided and uniform cooling must be ensured so uneven cooling will lead to will lead to defects such as bow and make even lead to sometimes the warpage or the dimensional inaccuracies also so that is one defect in regarding wall thickness we must ensure a uniform wall thickness then whenever we have to make the deep grooves the first guideline was related to if i can just revise here wall thickness second is related to the deep grooves when we have to make the deep grooves like these avoid grooves or openings that are relatively deep so this is fairly deep groove and when such type of grooves have to be made what can be the problem the problem can be due to inefficient cooling inside the groove maybe here the groove will tend to close so this is as extruded this is something which is the output of extrusion process so this is the part which has been extruded after extrusion and when it cools down you can see that this is the defect which has taken place because of the deep groove and non uniform cooling or insufficient cooling at the center or inside the groove so the extruded part geometry can change if different portions un undergo uneven 
cooling so we must design our extruded part in such a way that we ensure uniform cooling of the extruded part after the extrusion process so that is one standard guideline so two guidelines we have seen regarding the uniform wall thickness and we must avoid deep grooves in the extruded parts now the corners the uniform uh, this is one of the standard practices that we must avoid sharp corners sharp corners whether inside or outside should be avoided in the extruded cross section similar things we have seen in our previous session when we talked about the compression molded parts so in that case also we have seen sharp corners must be avoided sharp corners must also be avoided in sand casting as well as in die casting why because they cause difficulties in smooth melt flow and stress concentration in the final product so the sharp corners often lead to stress concentration in the final product so minimum internal radius must be 1 mm this is one guideline which must be kept in mind the minimum internal radius must be 1 mm outside radius must be equal to the internal radius plus a wall thickness so if we have a wall thickness the outer radius can be decided based on the wall thickness plus the internal radius and minimum internal radius must be equal to 1 mm or minimum must be 1 mm so in minimum is 1 mm outer will be minimum plus the thickness of the part so here we can see this is the this must not be sharp it must have a radius which is given here so different radius are given we can select as per our design geometry so this is uh, the sharpest possible is given here the diameter equals the wall thickness ideal outer outside radius has same center as well as the as the inside radius so when we are designing our extruded parts we must take care of the radius guidelines which are given here both for the internal section as well as for the external sections now this is the tolerance guide for plastic profile extrusions we can see the tolerance guide for the profile extrusions so here we can see wall thickness with wall thickness how the tolerance will change and these are the materials in this direction this is rigid vinyl polystyrene acronitrile butadiene styrene polycarbonate acry acrylic butyrate butyrate polypropylene flexible vinyl polyethylene so this direction is giving us the materials in this direction this column we have the wall thickness now depending upon the wall thickness we can see for a material that this is the angle which is given in this direction this is the wall thickness which is given so depending upon the wall thickness and the angles that are given the profile dimensions the range is given for the different material this is for polypropylene mostly we use it for making plastic parts or extruded parts so this is the tolerance that we must give to our plastic parts when we are designing the part so we can see uh, uh, that there are standard guidelines related to the extruded parts now if we can go into the much more detail we can further see for a specific material we can take a design and see the how the part can be designed so if the time permits in our course towards the end we will certainly take few case studies where we will select a part select the design of a part and see that which what all guidelines have been taken care of we can compare that this is a poor design we have designed it changed the profile from this to this sharp corners have been avoided deep grooves have been avoided the angles have been selected properly the tolerance has been selected properly the shrinkage has been taken care so we will certainly take one case or two case studies where we will show the design of a plastic part or the redesign of a plastic part part for better manufacturability but the broad things remain same that we must take care of all these guidelines related to corners related to ribs related to design of deep grooves related to the uniform wall thickness so all these parameters
parameters must be taken into account when we are designing a part which is going to be made by a plastic material or a polymer material as well as is going to be made by extrusion similarly now the another commercial process which we usually see around us is the injection molding process and most of the plastic parts that we use are made by injection molding on a commercial scale now what is injection molding quickly we will like to see so injection molding is one of the most commonly used processing techniques for the plastic components it is used to manufacture thin walled this is one of our attributes or design attribute which we are focusing again and again it is used to manufacture thin walled plastic parts for a wide variety two other attributes are coming shapes and sizes so we can see for a wide variety of shapes which can be from simple to complex and sizes from very small to medium will never be used for very large sizes but from small to medium sizes the process of injection molding can be used now within one sentence we have got three design uh, maybe attributes which can be characterized for the injection molding process first thing is thin walled sections can be made second is wide variety of shapes can be manufactured third is from very small to medium size products can be made using the injection molding process now plastic material is melted in the heating chamber as i have already told for molding of plastics there are three steps only first one is heating and then injected into the mold so second one is giving shape inside the mold giving shape and the last is the cooling process so for any plastic molding process these three steps may be common mostly they will be common first one is heating or melting the plastic second one is molding or giving it the shape and third one is cooling and finally the finished part is ejected out how it is ejected if you remember some of the diagrams we have already seen with the help of the ejector pins which we have already seen in the compression molding process or the compression molding diagram also so basically in injection molding the two halves of the mold or the die will close inside there will be cavity the plastic in the form of pellets mostly for thermoplastic materials injection molding is used will go into the barrel which is heated so we have to control the temperature profile within the barrel and then this material is pushed into the die cavity in the molten state and it takes the shape of the die cavity or the mold cavity and finally solidifies into the final product that we want to produce so let us now try to see it with the help of a diagram this is the final product that we are trying to make this shape is the product that is going to be made and we can see that the mold is in two halves this is the mold given here this is one half of the mold this is second half of the mold and this is the barrel here i have used the word barrel just a few so a few minutes back so there is a reciprocating screw which is rotating this is the feed hopper so the raw material this is the raw material in the form of pellets or thermoplastic pellet so the raw material comes into the barrel we have a reciprocating screw and there are heaters as we have seen in case of extrusion also this is heater this is heater heating elements so you have heat and the material is sheared by the uh, reciprocating action of the screw and then this molten material from here is pushed into the through this gate is pushed into the die cavity or the mold cavity and once the material has solidified the two halves of the mold open and the material may fall down into the basket or into the maybe collecting chamber so you have a clamping clamping unit then there is a injection unit here so all this is injection unit and this is a clamping unit where the two halves of the mold will close and will form a die cavity inside so this is the injection molding setup what is our target what we want to learn we don't want to learn the process of injection molding because this we have already covered in our course on processing of non metals or processing of polymers and polymer composites our target here is to see 
how this design of the part or the product design must take care of certain recommendations. Now, what are these recommendations for the design of this part? Because if we do not design this part properly, our injection molding process will not be able to produce the product as per the requirement. So, let us now quickly see that what are our specific design requirements for this part which has to be made by the injection molding process. So, here very very colorful slide, we can, we, why this colorful slide is there? Because we see different injection molding parts in different colors. If you see the plastic buckets that we use, so many colorful buckets are there, green, red, blue. So, we have different types of raw material which can be used, but most of the polymers that we use are generally white or off white in those uh, maybe white family only. But we add the coloring agents or the coloring pigments to give the desired colors to the products. So, here we see so many products, wide variety of products which can be made by the injection molding process. And if you have a closer look, I think in the slide you may not be able to see, there are the these products have no sharp corners. If you see all these products, maybe this is one product, this is another product. So, when you see these products, you will definitely realize that these products do not have any sharp corners. Then another guideline that they will have uniform wall thickness. As an engineer, if we look at a injection molded part, we will see that the designer has already taken care that the uniform wall thickness must be maintained. So, if ribs are there, the thickness of the ribs will be decided based on the wall thickness. So, basically these guidelines do exist and engineers definitely make use of these guidelines, but for new designers people who want to venture into the product design field, these guidelines are mandatory. So, many times new designers come up with designs which are very good, but are not manufacturable. Why? Because these guidelines have not been taken care of. So, from now on, if you are a learner of this course, you can just look at the plastic products around you and see that whether the guidelines which are there for designing of parts which have to be made by injection molding or compression molding or blow molding process, whether those guidelines have been taken care or not. If they are taken care, how the product is better as compared to a product in which the guidelines have not been taken care. So, basically here we can see different types or different colors of inputs can be there and the products are also shown here and most of the actual products are shown here. So, the, these are the injection molding products and what are the guidelines? Three of them already I have written regarding the sharp corners, regarding the wall thickness, regarding the design of the ribs. Now, quickly let us see the specific guidelines for all these uh, attributes or the design attributes that we have seen. So, what are the design guidelines? So, plastics are used in a variety of diverse and demanding applications. In the previous slide, there is nothing much to say about this point. So, many different applications, diverse applications you have seen. So, there are design elements that are common to most plastic parts because we have been discussing these again and again common to most of the plastic parts. What are these design elements? One by one we can see wall thickness, we have seen it for compression molding, we have seen it for extrusion, ribs again we have seen, bosses, gussets, drafts. So, all these recommendations for all these may vary depending upon the process that we are choosing. So, if you remember recommendations may vary. If you remember in the start of our session on injection molding, we have seen that it is used for thin walled parts, which means that the first guideline regarding wall thickness is specific to injection molding. 
so wall thickness has to be thin in case of injection molding whereas it height can be different in case of the other processes so wall thickness will vary if you choose injection molding you can use it for thinner wall sections also but if you are using compression molding the wall thickness range may vary if you are using extrusion the wall thickness range may vary so let us now see for injection molding wall thickness keep the walls as thin as possible one guideline this is a guideline for parts to be made by injection molding process one guideline sorry keep the walls as thin as possible thick enough so which, which is the larger limit thick enough to meet the strength requirements thinner is always better if too thick part will warp or crack so we have to see the optimal range or the optimal value for the thickness it must not be too thick if the wall thickness is too high or too large there are chances of warpage if it is too thin there are manufacturability issues it may not we may not be able to manufacture it to the dimensions so we have to optimize the wall thickness but certainly the wall thickness values for injection molding can be on the lower side because injection molding is a process which can be used for making thin walled parts second guideline use a uniform wall thickness which is common to most of the plastic processes areas where the wall it wall increases in thickness are subject to warping cracking and show sink marks so problem number 1 warping problem number 2 cracking problem number 3 sink marks why because of the increase in the thickness so areas where the wall increases in thickness these are the problems so therefore we must optimize the thickness of our wall change must be gradual and not exceed 20% of the thickness this is another guideline so we must ensure gradual change in the wall thickness so if it is abrupt change in the wall thickness it will create problems so let us see with this with the help of an example regarding the wall thickness so here we can see this is a section which is cut here so here this is the wall thickness here this is the wall thickness but if you see here the wall thickness is much more so what we can do core out the thick section so what we have done we have cored out from here the thick section and now in this range we are having a uniform wall thickness so core out the thick sections of the part why to create a uniform wall thickness so this is our target so we can create a uniform wall thickness here also you can see thicker portion thicker portion we have cored it out so that there we can ensure a uniform wall thickness similar is the case here from here we can ensure a uniform wall thickness so we, it is cored out from here so that we can produce a uniform wall thickness here we have ensured a uniform wall thickness so this is the correct parts correct design core out thick sections as shown on right to maintain a more uniform wall thickness so if we ensure a uniform wall thickness it will definitely help us to avoid the defects such as warping such as cracking and it will lead to a good quality of the product now here also we can see the thickness transition which was our second point poor design incorrect it must never be used but yes gradual change is always advisable here also gradual change advisable here also to some extent it is advisable when thickness changes are necessary you can't avoid the thickness changes use the gradual transitions which is given here these are the gradual transitions whereas this is not recommended a very sharp transition in the cross section then regarding the corners corners of the part should be rounded very good guideline to reduce the stress concentration at the corner and make the removal easier because the part has to be ejected out of the mold and therefore to make the ejection process easier we must avoid the use of corners they are the number one cause of failure 
stress concentration, poor flow patterns of the mold, uh, melt or the molten plastic and increased tool wear. So, if you have very sharp corner, the plastic is again and again coming in contact with the corner or the die uh, corner of the uh, mold. So, there are chances of increased tool wear also. So, the sharp corners are leading to so many problems like part failure, stress concentration, poor flow pattern, increased tool wears. So, can these uh, problems can easily be avoided by giving a radius at the corner. So, the corners of the part should be rounded. So, they can be made rounded to reduce all these problems or to mitigate the effect of all these defects that may take place. Now, this is a very good example. So, it is too thin must be avoided. This is a corner design too thin. This is too thick there can be a problem here as we have seen in case of sand casting shrinkage cavities are formed. So, here also too thick may lead to problems, but here this is the right guideline which is also mentioned here. You can see corner should always be designed with a minimum fillet radius of 50 percent of the wall thickness. So, this is the wall thickness T here 50 percent of the wall thickness. So, the fillet radius must be 50 percent of the wall thickness and outer radius. So, this is related to the inner radius, the outer radius of 150 percent of the thickness to maintain a constant wall thickness. So, this is already we have seen along this direction there is a constant wall thickness by ensuring proper rounded corners. Now, coming on to the draft. So, draft is necessary for the ejection of parts from the mold which we have already seen. Recommended draft angle is 1 degree with half degree on the ribs. Draft all surface parallel to the direction of mold separation. Now, suppose these are our two mold halves and in between we have the cavity. When these will close this is the direction of our mold separation. So, we draft all surfaces parallel to the direction of mold separation. So, whatever surfaces are there which are parallel to the direction of mold, mold separation there we must provide some draft. The recommended values for draft are already given. Use standard 1 degree of draft plus an additional 1 degree of draft for every 0.01 inch of the texture depth. So, if there is a texture then accordingly we have to modify our value of the draft that we have to provide, but the general values are given here. So, these are the draft guidelines which we can see parts with no draft. In this part there is no draft you have a straight surfaces, but here we have a draft this is given here 0 0.5 degree minimum. So, this is a correct design of a part. This is again on the ribs also the draft is given in this case straight surfaces no draft is given here, but here the draft is given here also straight surface no draft in this case again it is made in an angle. So, the draft has been provided. So, this draft values will definitely help in the easy ejection of parts after the molding has been completed. Now, coming on to the ribs. Ribs are an economical means to improve the stiffness and strength without increasing the overall wall thickness. Other uses for ribs, so all of us know that why do we put ribs, ribs in our product design. Other uses for ribs are locating components of an assembly, providing alignments in the mating part and acting as stops or guides. So, these are other uses for providing the ribs. Now, proper rib design involves 5 main issues. We can see what must be the thickness of the rib, what must be the height of the rib, location, quantity and moldability. Sometimes we may have a rib design which is difficult to mold. So, we must ensure that all these 5 parameters that is the thickness, height, location, quantity and moldability is taken care when we design ribs in our product design. So, very easily we can see here these are the ribs shown here two ribs. So, the height is shown in terms of the thickness T this is a thickness T wall thickness T in terms of T what must be the height what must be the 
distance between that edges of the two ribs what must be the fillet or the corner radius here is specified what must be the draft angle is specified here so in parts where sink marks are of no concern rib base thickness t can be 75 to 85 percent of the wall thickness so wall thickness given here is t so this small t is the rib thickness at the base in parts where sink marks are of no concern sometimes we may have sink marks like this so if this is not our concern then this t the small value uh, t in parts where sink marks are of no concern rib base thickness this is the rib the base thickness small t this t can be 75 to 80 percent of the wall thickness that is the capital T where sink marks are objectionable rib base thickness small t should not exceed 50 percent of the wall thickness. So, in case the sink marks are important to us then this T must not exceed 50 percent of the wall thickness that is a capital T. So, this is these are the standard recommendations guidelines which we, we must take into account when we are designing the plastic parts which are going to be having ribs for the strength purposes. Now, bosses, bosses find use in many part designs as points for attachments and assembly. Most common variety consists of cylindrical projection with holes designed to. So, we will see this with the help of an example, please do not worry because uh, when we see the diagram we are able to understand it in a better manner. So, what are bosses? Bosses find use in many part design as points for attachment and assembly. So, when we have to assemble the two plastic parts together on one side we may have a boss and the other part or a fastener will come and fit into this boss. Now, how the boss would look like that we will see and why it is used most common variety consists of cylindrical projection of the boss with holes designed to receive. So, you have a hole where you will put your screw, you can put the screw, you can put the threaded inserts or other types of the fastening devices. So, you when you join the two parts together on one side there may be a boss. Now, how the boss would look like? You can see a standard boss design. So, here this is the wall thickness T. So, we can see here the outside diameter of bosses should remain 2 to 2.4 times the outside diameter of the screw or the insert. Now, this is basically you can see small d is the outside diameter of the screw or the insert and the outside diameter of the boss is 2 to 2.4 times of the d. This is d here. So, this is 2 to 2.4 times d. So, the outside diameter of the insert, this is outside diameter of the insert that is d. So, this is d here. This is the uh, di diameter of the shank of the fastener. So, the outside diameter of the bosses that is this is the outside diameter which is shown here must be 2 to 2.4 times of the outside diameter of the screw this is capital D here. To prevent the sink marks keep the boss wall thickness to nominal wall thickness the same for the ribs. So, the to prevent the sink marks the boss wall thickness to the nominal wall thickness same as for the ribs. So, whatever guidelines we follow for the ribs similar guidelines we can follow for the bosses also regarding the thickness of the boss. Bosses should have a blended radius at the base. So, that is also a important guideline. Now, this is another boss sink recess these are the two recesses here. So, a recess around the base of the thick boss reduces the problem of a sink. Sometimes a sink may be formed here. So, that sink can be avoided by providing these two recesses. So, bo bo boss sink recess will help us to provide the problem of the sink. So, let us now conclude the session for today. We have tried to understand the design or the product design guidelines which must be kept in mind by a product designer when the product is going to be made by the extrusion process or by the injection molding process. So, if we keep these values, these recommendations in mind while we are designing our part, our ribs will be manufactured properly, our wall thickness will be uniform, cooling will be uniform, warpage will be avoided and many other kinds of defects that may arise 
arise during the molding process can easily be avoided if we adhere to if we strictly follow all these guidelines so with this we conclude the today's session in our next session we will try to focus on another process with the design guidelines related to the product design thank you